day, everyone. Uh, wherever you are, I'm Claudio Borio, the head of the Monetary and Economic Department, and I have the pleasure and honor uh, chairing this session, which is the second in the series of our reformatted annual conference, the 19th annual conference, which now takes the form of uh, webinars. This should be a great session. We have two very distinguished speakers, uh, which uh, who surprisingly, if you like, or interestingly, <laughs> overlapped at the ECB. Uh, the author of the paper is uh, Lucrezia Reichlin, the professor of economics at the London Business School and chair of the department, who was director general of research at the ECB between uh, 2005 and 2008. And the discussion is Professor Otmar Ising, who is president of the Center for Financial Studies in Frankfurt since 2006, and who was chief economist at the ECB and responsible for both the research and the general economics department between 1998 and 2006. And before that, he was member of the board at the Deutsche Bundesbank. And there, again, he was very much the chief economist of the institution. Now, the topic of today is monetary and fiscal policy interactions in the euro, euro area, or to be more precise, monetary fiscal crosswinds in the European Monetary Union. Um, and I think it's a natural follow-up to Ricardo Rice's uh, presentation on the sustainability of fiscal policy, uh, which, if you remember, towards the end of the presentation, we got into questions of how monetary policy and fiscal policy interacted. So the rules of the game, we have 35 minutes for the presentation, 15 minutes for the formal discussion, and then we'll have something like 20 minutes for the general Q&A. So without any further ado, Lucrezia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Claudio, and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to speak under the severe eyes of my former boss at the European Central Bank, Otmar Isink, and uh, whom uh, actually uh, it's, it's very nice that uh, you put us together on this uh, very controversial issue, which is uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy crosswinds. Before I start, let me introduce my co-authors, uh, Juan Antolin Diaz, who will be here as a panelist uh, this afternoon. Uh, he is a PhD student at Orlando Business School, and Giovanni Ricco, who is now, he's a professor at Warwick, but uh, is also working now at the European Central Bank. So he asked me to say that uh, the views expressed in these papers uh, are not those uh, of the European Central Banks, but those of the authors. Um, let me start uh, uh, by saying, oops, now I can't move this, uh, the, I cannot move the, Okay, I can, sorry. Uh, let me uh, start with a little bit of motivation. Um, obviously, monetary understanding <laughs> the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy is important, uh, uh, is important uh, for policy, but I should also argue for the governance uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, central banking uh, uh, is such an important topic that this is actually the second uh, presentation on this topic uh, in your conference. I would say that this uh, issue has become more important today, partly because we are at the zero lower bound uh, and uh, uh, there is a possibility that actually fiscal policy is more effective than monetary policy so that uh, the crosswinds uh, uh, between the two tools, monetary and fiscal, perhaps should be avoided. Also, with COVID, uh, uh, there is research pointed to the fact that fiscal policy is potentially more effective to deal with uh, sexual heterogeneity. Another reason why, uh, you know, fiscal policy possibly more powerful than monetary policy. Uh, we are actually today discussing uh, the case of a monetary union when possibility of coordination between monetary and fiscal policy is more problematic for obvious reasons. And so we are asking a question, we are not asking a normative question today, but uh, uh, that's a positive question, an empirical question. 
what do we know about how monetary and fiscal policy interact in the in the European Monetary Union and how should we put together a reasonable empirical model to have a chance to ask to that question. So let me just first uh, talk about the mechanism through which fiscal and monetary policy interact. Well, even in the, you know, in any model that uh, macro model that uh, you have in mind, the simplest macro model, these interactions arise via the intertemporal general government budget constraint. And uh, obviously these interactions are more sizable and uh, visible when the balance sheets are large. And this is uh, actually one more motivation of why we are so much interested in this issue today, where both the balance sheet of the central bank and uh, you know, public debt uh, are so high. Um, now, um, in a monetary union, uh, which is uh, an asymmetric monetary union like EMU, uh, we have a common inflation objective by, by pursued by a central bank, which may be or may not be offset by crosswinds from decentralized fiscal policy. So our empirical uh, framework today, which what we propose, uh, it's it's an attempt of of looking at what's the quantitative importance of this crosswind, possibly frost frost winds, and um, and how this it's important also to account for inflation dynamics in the medium and in the long run in the euro area. Um, at the end, what we want to uh, understand is wh whether uh, what has happened historically can be characterized more as coordination or, uh, or crosswind. Um, so, a uh, few words about uh, what kind of empirical model we have put together. So, it is a, a model uh, we, in which we are identifying uh, both conventional and unconventional monetary policy surprises, and I will uh, briefly later explain you how we identify them. And uh, we will study how um, the response of, uh, of fiscal and, uh, you know, debt variables and other macro variables, both at business cycle frequencies, but also in the long run, because our empirical model will be somehow constrained so that the long run budget identity is satisfied. So we will see how inflation in the long run adjusts to, um, to rebal will rebalance in order to satisfy the, the, the budget identity. Um, we will characterize the European Monetary Union as a union in which the central bank has a target in terms of aggregate inflation, but each country issues their own debt and therefore uh, issues uh, face, face different market rates, different premium. Um, the intertemporal budget constraint will hold in the aggregate but not for each country. So this is a it's it's a uh, it's a union in which uh, uh, transfers are possible. Transfers between countries are possible. Whether there are transfers or not is an entirely uh, empirical question. Um, so these are the characteristics of the model, and then uh, uh, the data that we will use. Uh, actually, we have constructed a new fiscal data set uh, for the four largest countries of the AMU. So we will deal. We will only study Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, and the aggregate. And um, the key uh, variables in this fiscal data set uh, is, uh, um, is, uh, is is the time series for the market value of public debt for each of these countries and uh, uh, returns on the portfolio of that public debt and uh, uh, data on fiscal primary surpluses. And then other data, macroeconomic data that we will include are more standards, but this, the fiscal data set uh, uh, is part of the effort related to this paper. Uh, the model actually will be a vector autoregression uh, model, um, which we identify uh, by combining a narrative and sign restrictions. And uh, the restrictions will uh, uh, on the for, for the uh, for the long run uh, budget identity will actually be imposed uh, through what we call uh, in Bayesian statistics dogmatic priors. So um, let me just uh, uh, give you uh, a little bit of a flavor about uh, the framework. Uh, 
this is the law of motion for the market value of the government debt, where B is the market value of the government debt. Uh, so I, I want to uh, stress that this is the market value of the, the, of the, of the government debt, not the debt outstanding. And R uh, are actually the nominal returns. And here, we uh, we follow actually a tradition in this literature. I'm here referring ma mainly to Hall and Sargent paper in 2011, um, in which uh, for, by uh, nominal returns, most imp importantly, is not just the explicit. Uh, so they, they they include all sources of payments to debt holders, not just the coupon payments and principal repayments. So which are the, are the explicit ones, if you want, which are, you know typically they are used in some of the empiric in this literature but also implicit uh, uh, ones, so capital gain, for example, from interest rate charges. So we have uh, a debt service, we have the nominal returns, okay, as I described them, and then we have uh, S, which is the primary surplus, okay, so that the total deficit then will be V times R minus uh, the primary surplus. So this is the law. Of, uh, this is the budget cost, the law motion for the market value of government debt. Now I can express the same uh, the same law motion uh, by dividing everything uh, by GDP. And uh, so here um, I will have the same equation as before. Basically, that uh, but uh, now everything is deflated by it, uh, by, by GDP. So I have now debt to GDP ratio at time t plus one on the left hand side here, debt at time t here. And uh, here on the numerator, I have the debt service. Uh, and then on the denominator, I have growth and inflation minus the primary surpluses uh, also in terms of as a ratio of GDP. Uh, so this is should be familiar to everybody. Um, it's just a law of motion of the market value of the government debt over GDP. Uh, now we want to uh, use uh, these uh, uh, restrictions uh, in, a, in, a, in a linear empirical model. So we, we take a first order Taylor expansion around the steady state. We linearize everything. So everything from now on will be in uh, small letters rather than capital letters to indicate that this is these are logs. So uh, we have here the log of debt to GDP ratio at the end of period T. Um, uh, this is the uh, at t at the end of period t, t at the end of period t plus one here. Uh, the log of nominal return on the portfolio of government bonds, uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, the growth rate uh, of GDP. This is the inflation rate, uh, and this is uh, uh, the real primary surpluses to GDP ratio. Okay, so the intuition is that uh, the log uh, debt to GDP ratio increases with higher returns and decreases with higher surpluses, growth, or inflation. Now, we want to get to a present value identity. So what we do, we iterate forward the, the, the flow budget constraints, and we assume a, a kind of a no Ponzi condition. And then we get a present value identity for the aggregate euro area debt. OK, again, here you have now, this is a present value. So this, uh, you have an infinite sum on the right hand side. Uh, the, what does this equation mean is that the value of the debt today here is the sum of all uh, future surpluses. These are the primary surpluses, remember, the little s. Uh, this is the growth rate, so, so the, the, the sum of the, of the future growth rate of the, of the primary surpluses minus the sum of all future uh, real returns on debt. Okay, so again, this is uh, completely, you know, uh, trivial uh, uh, stuff. Now, uh, this is actually, um, now um, we, we can actually, let me, let me just go back here. So this equation, which I think everybody knows, uh, can actually be rewritten. And this is actually the key for, for how to understand our empirical work uh, in terms of unexpected inflation. Okay, so it's the same equation turn around. Uh, um, which uh, we will be written in terms of unexpected inflation as a function so, 
of the shock to the present values of the surplus, uh, to the future uh, real returns, uh, and uh, to the future great growth rates. And uh, this is actually a trick that uh, uh, John Cochrane has done in a, in, a, in, a, in a recent paper, and actually we borrow his idea for the case of a federation. Of course, we have a slightly more difficult problem because we are dealing with a monetary union, so uh, which has the characteristic that I, I, I briefly described before. But uh, okay, so if you uh, if you trust my algebra that flow constraints uh, um, and the present value identity, uh, if I take if we take uh, expectations, then they can uh, you know boil down to this equation number four, which uh, you have to look at it very carefully because it would be like the you know the basis of our empirical calculations. Okay. So here, what do we have? We have the um, um, the surprise on uh, on real returns. This is the inflation rates, and this is the nominal returns. So, so this is a, a delta of, of the expectation. Okay, uh, as a um, as a function, as I said before, okay, of surprises in fiscal adjustment, future fiscal adjustment, future growth, and future real returns. So the idea here is that. Uh, um, so the the, uh, the the change in the path of inflation today has to be matched by revisions in this quantity, okay? Where the fiscal, you know, appears here in terms of the uh, of the of the primary surpluses. Uh, and this is a case of a, of, of a federation, so which uh, you know it's uh, you can apply to the U.S. when any unitary uh, monetary system, you know, one central bank, one fiscal authority. Uh, one federal issuance of debt, so the same uh, returns uh, on, on uh, you know, because you, we just have on each country, so a single yield curve, common returns, okay? Now, if we want to adapt this to the monetary union, so with the characteristic I briefly described before, I have to unpack this uh, identity and uh, um, and, and, and writing it uh, as in these slides, uh, where in red, uh, I, I just uh, kind of uh, stress the unpacking, okay? So that little r now will be, uh, uh, will have a component here, which is r bar, which is, um, which is an average of the return across countries, which can be understood as a synthetic uh, common yield curve, if you want. And, um, and then a, a weighted sum uh, of the premium. Okay, so that uh, um, and which would be this specific for each I I is a country. Okay, uh, this part will uh, will stay the same. Uh, be, uh, so uh, sorry. So uh, so this is the premium. So that, that's the unpacking on the premium, which you have, you have you have it here on the left hand side, but then also you have it here on the right hand side. Um, this corresponds to the idea that you have uh, one central bank and many fiscal authorities. So, because you have national issuance of debt, so each country uh, face uh, different uh, uh, country-specific premium. Now, we can further unpack this equation, and then uh, you also can have here instead of the aggregate fiscal adjustment, you can have a weighted average of uh, the primary uh, surpluses. Okay, so here you have another red component. And uh, so here, um, um, so the joint, this, uh, this way of unpacking, if you want, tells us that the joint dynamic uh, of inflation depends on the composition of the debt. Uh, and the, you know the heterogeneous uh, uh, behavior in terms of fiscal policy at the, at the country level. Uh, now, we could continue to unpacking and have different uh, growth rate and different inflation rate. We don't do it uh, uh, for this presentation. We will do it uh, in the paper eventually uh, because we're focusing on the long run so that uh, we, uh, we just say, you know, each country have the same growth rate and the same inflation rate. Um, so uh, we abstract for, for that level of heterogeneity, okay? Uh, okay, having said that, let me then uh, present the data and then empirical model and give you the results. Um, so these are the data which, uh, as I said, uh, we construct uh, uh, from different sources. Uh, um, this is the market value of the debt divided by, uh, by GDP for different countries. This is Germany, France, uh, Italy, and Spain. 
You see that both in Italy, uh, in Italy and in Germany, there is a certain amount of uh, cyclicality, if you want, in the market value of the debt, where there is much more persistent in France and in Spain in this sample. So we start our sample in 1991. These are quarterly data. Um, these are the surpluses which are much more, uh, which are which are cyclical to a certain extent. Um, Germany and Italy, over the period, had on average uh, a primary surpluses. Uh, France and uh, Spain have a similar behavior since the financial crisis, where they actually had on average uh, primary deficit. Um, now, on the basis of the market value of the debt and on, on the primary surpluses, we can back up uh, the returns. Okay, so by using uh, uh, you know the uh, the the debt uh, uh, the relationship between debt and, uh, and primary surpluses this of course is not totally precise and so we deal with this imprecision uh, with some details that uh, you know i, I can discuss uh, in, in if, if any question but i don't want to uh, lose time at this stage you can look at the, at the returns uh, on the government board, uh, bond portfolio this is the black line here for the different countries you see that they're, they're quite volatile uh, I, we plot them uh, against uh, this uh, dotted blue, which um, is the three months common uh, uh, interest rate, and uh, the pale red here, which is one period holding on a 10-year bond. And um, you, um, and you know, so this gives you basically an, uh, an intuition of what we uh, what we have on these returns. And this black uh, return, the returns have, have a very important uh, uh, function in our empirical work because when uh, the the shock, when there is a shock to the system, you have a reaction of the first fiscal surpluses, but we also have a reaction of returns that uh, may actually offset the uh, reaction, the fiscal surpluses, and this has implication for inflation. Um, okay, so now the empirical model. So the model is a, uh, is a VAR, which uh, is a Bayesian VAR. Uh, is a very large uh, 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 VAR because not only we have those fiscal variables that I, I just uh, uh, introduced to you, but we also have other variables. Uh, uh, we have cross-country spreads, uh, we have um, interest rates, inflation, inflation expectations, I will show them you, to you later. So overall, we have a VAR with uh, 25 variables for France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and some euro area aggregate. Uh, the sample is quarterly from 91 to 2019. Uh, so this is a, uh, you know, it's quite a complex model to estimate. So uh, we, uh, we put priors uh, in order to deal with the curse of dimensionality. This is related to work that both my co-authors and I have done in the past. Uh, in order to, um, to uh, put the constraints uh, of, the, of the budget identity, which I described to you, um, we put dogmatic priors on the steady state of the VR, consistent with our linearization. So, and this is, these are the priors. So the debt to GDP ratio so is stationary as 60% of national GDP, according to the rules. Uh, this is in the long, in the steady state, of course. The primary sur surplus, so we, we are balanced at the steady state. Real GDP growth uh, is close to the sample average. The steady state, 1.5%. Inflation uh, is consistent uh, with the ECB objective or below, but close to 2% over the medium term. And uh, so that the nominal returns uh, are uh, equal to 3.3 percent. Okay, and then we put Minnesota style prior to shrink the parameters uh, to a stationarity. Now, identification, it might be, uh, um, I mean, I, I want to say something because this is actually uh, very much uh, uh, based on the work uh, of Juan, who is here with me. The brilliant paper that he wrote with uh, one co-author, unfortunately not me, which has been uh, just published in the American Economic Review, in which they um, they propose uh, to identify shocks by combining uh, the familiar uh, strategy of sign restriction 
with uh, actually uh, signs that come from a narrative uh, uh, of, uh, um, of the monetary policy uh, you know, history. So in terms of sign, um, we, uh, as I said, we want to uh, identify both a conventional and an unconventional monetary policy. We define a conventional monetary policy at, at uh, a shock which is negative on impact on the euro area GDP growth, zero in the long run, uh, negative uh, uh, on, on, on impact on inflation, or positive and more positive on the short term rate, uh, which is now is the uh, which we, uh, we 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 consider the, the three months OIS rate. And then positive, but less so uh, on Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, 10 year yield. And this is to make sure that uh, if we have a contraction, the slope of the yield curve will dec decline. Uh, opposite if we have an easing. The unconventional uh, will have the opposite restriction that the, ten, the long term yields move more than the short term yields, so that uh, the, slope, the slope will increase uh, uh, following a contraction. Um, and then, of course, we have the long run neutrality uh, on GDP growth. Now, uh, the narrative sign is that, uh, to, uh, you know, the, the econometric literature shows that these traditional sign restrictions alone uh, uh, are too weak to reach some economic conclusions. So, in the work of one, uh, show that uh, you can complement them with narrative restrictions. Uh, so, you constrain the historical shocks. Uh, around some key historical events uh, to make them uh, you know compatible with the narrative and in this case uh, um, what does it mean this for example if you know that uh, uh, in october 79 in the us uh, you know there was a contraction in shock due to the volcker new regime then you want to say to the model uh, discard uh, any parameters that are not uh, you know coherent with that narrative okay so that's the intuition so in, in our case okay here you have uh, you know the history since 1999 of the ois the the, the german uh, uh, government 10 year government yields the mro rate and the corridors uh, we, we put two restrictions. One is uh, for the, so we say that the increase in the three months OIS in the third quarter of 2008 and uh, in the first quarter of 2011 were mostly due to the con contractual conventional monetary policy shocks. In both, uh, in, in the third, in July, we had an increase in interest rate, conventional. And actually, in April and then in July here in 2011, you also had an increase, but it was announced in the first quarter, so we put the restriction on the first quarter. So that's for the, for the, for the conventional. For the unconventional, we, uh, we use uh, one narrative here. So we say that in Q1 2015, uh, the, 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 um, the decline in long-term yields was mostly due to the expansion on the unconventional monetary policy shock that was correspond to the introduction of QE. Um, now, before I show you the empirics, uh, and uh, um, I think I'm, I hope I am on track with time, I just want to, uh, um, to make a remark, which would be very important to understand uh, the results that I'm about to present. So here, um, uh, what happens with bond returns is really important to understand the, the inflation dynamics. Okay, so we want to focus to fiscal, but we know that we also have to take care of what happens to the returns on government debt. And um, so uh, what is the mechanism? So if you have an unexpected increase in short-term interest rate, then you have uh, uh, increases in long-term bond yields. Uh, bond prices move inversely with the yields and fall on impact. Uh, this implies a negative return to, to today's bondholders, okay? But uh, forward-looking returns increase, however, with yields. So for, for this is, is, is very, uh, you know, for, for each bond, uh, for each single bond uh, at a given maturity, that's, that should always be the case that the change today is compensated by the change in the future. Here is a little bit more complex because we are talking about a portfolio of bonds with, uh, you know, a maturity structure. Uh, but, you know, the, the, what happens today should be to a certain extent compensated 
to what happened tomorrow. Oh, so uh, a government uh, uh, seeking to issue new debt tomorrow, as a consequence with increasing yields, uh, uh, will face higher servicing costs. So uh, unconventional policy, such as forward guidance and QE, uh, which target long-term yields directly, will have a bigger effect on government's financing rates uh, the longer the maturity structure of the debt. And um, of course, this implies that the transmission of conventional policies will have to be heterogeneous across country, um, also because of, of the heterogeneity of the maturity st structure, and also because of the different risk that each country uh, uh, face, because that's, if you remember, is an element of heterogeneity, uh, you know, which characterize uh, the monetary union. Okay, so uh, here are the impulse response functions. Oh, I'm sure that you cannot see anything because they are all very small. So I want to just focus on some of them. Uh, I'll start with the conventional monetary policy. So what I will do now, I will first present the impulse response functions, which will tell us the adjustment of the cycle frequency. So here we are considering up to 32 quarters. Uh, and then I will present you a table uh, which uh, it will give you the, like the whole long-term adjustment, infinite horizon, and that table will correspond exactly to that uh, um, intertemporal budget constraints expressions uh, uh, expressed in terms of inflation surprises. Okay, so there will be a match with those equations I present you, I presented you at the beginning. Okay, so but let's start with the uh, with the business cycle frequency, so with the impulse response functions. Okay, so uh, I have to apologize because everybody these days, uh, you know, have in mind the monetary policy easing, but if, if, instead I would present result for a monetary policy contraction. Okay, so you just have to do the 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 the, the you know kind of mental exercise to uh, you know to reverse the sign if you want to look at what happened when you ease. Okay, so here is a contraction. So growth goes down. Um, it goes down uh, uh, and it stays down persistently. Okay, although in the long run, you know, will be uh, will be neutral because this is our identification restrictions. Inflation goes down and then uh, you know kind of bounce up and then uh, you know, but it moves uh, not very much as you can see. I mean, not surprisingly, given what happened in, the, in, in that period. But now let's look at the surpluses. Uh, I will not focus on all, on all the impulse response function here, but just on the ones which are important for these fiscal monetary interactions. Um, so here, actually, this is Germany. So when there is a contraction, uh, Germany in the short run uh, reacts by increasing in surpluses. So in a way, it goes together with monetary policies. Monetary policies try to contract, the fiscal authority contracts as well. However, it kind of compensated later on, and uh, you know, uh, because uh, probably because of the balanced budget rules, so that uh, you know that what has done on the positive side in the short run will be actually compensated. Uh, uh, over time, and they will stay negative. And when you sum over the long horizon, so you'll see that the overall response I will show you it will, is negative rather than positive. Okay, so that's Germany. Uh, France instead, uh, you know, increases increases the surplus and they stay up. Okay, so that uh, but you know it's on, on the short run is very similar uh, similar reaction. Uh, the same for Italy. Uh, Spain uh, is uh, is not very well estimated, uh, the, and uh, you know, so you see, it's, it's very uncertain. So we cannot say, you know, there is no this, this thing is not statistically significant. Um, okay, so that's for the fiscal. So overall, in the short run, there is uh, uh, there is coordination rather than crosswind, if you go with my terminology. Okay, so the the monetary contracts, the fiscal contracts as well. Uh, now let's see what happens to returns. Okay, the returns. Okay, we uh, the, the monetary policy has implies an increase in yields, so returns move in the opposite uh, 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 with the opposite sign uh, than yields. So they go down uh, um, immediately in the short run, and then they bounce up. Okay, for that mechanism that I described, they will have to bounce up to you know to to compensate the the first negative uh, impact effect. The same for France, the same for Italy, and uh, less so for Spain, again, now since it's statistically significant. 
So now uh, let's look at the table, okay? So this is the table that uh, I described before. So uh, correspond to equation four, which uh, uh, on the left-hand side, you have the uh, inflation surprise, okay? So uh, at, at impact minus the weighted average of the returns, so the surprise on the returns, okay? That's what you have on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, uh, you have uh, the future uh, adjustment uh, in the in the expected uh, in the, so the surprise uh, in the in the future uh, surpluses, returns and inflation, and uh, uh, the terms uh, on G so on the growth rate is zero because our restriction is that monetary policy is neutral in the long run. So this is basically is a table that uh, summarizes the results uh, uh, about uh, uh, you know you 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 have this system you shock it uh, with a, uh, with a, uh, an increase in short term interest rate and then everything moves okay because returns move uh, surpluses moves and so on and inflation will have to adjust in the long run to respect uh, that uh, uh, long term budget identity so this is for the total the last uh, uh, column here and uh, uh, so uh, these, these numbers uh, have to adapt and, and they do more or less, I think, with decimal. So uh, let me flag something. Uh, not surprisingly, given what you have seen with the impulse response functions, uh, overall, uh, if you have a contraction, primary surpluses respond uh, with a surplus, with increasing the surplus, okay? Uh, so the in parentheses we have a, a this is a positive number. Uh, so uh, in on so this is the the fiscal adjustment and this actually should put uh, uh, a, a, a negative pressure on inflation. Okay, so that so more surplus, more you know, inflation should should go down to adjust this this uh, to adjust to that. Now, uh, returns, okay, in, on impact they're negative, but in the future they adjust more than what, uh, than how they go down uh, on impact. So, and they move a lot, and they, lose, they move much, much more than what happened on the surplus. And by the way, this result is, uh, is um, coherent with what happened with the U.S. Uh, on, uh, you know, when, uh, US, when this uh, with Cochrane estimates. Uh, I'm running out of time. No. No, you, you still have uh, a couple of minutes. Uh, okay, so I, I, will, uh, I will wrap it up uh, earlier. So, but uh, here is the, is the punchline of, uh, of this table, is that this very large adjustment on returns is uh, much larger than the adjustment on, on the fiscal surpluses. And... Um, Overall, uh, you know, th this uh, puts uh, a pressure on inflation, which is uh, which is negative. This, however, you know, has a positive effect on inflation. So overall, inflation on impact will decrease by uh, 0 0.04. And uh, uh, but you know, since this is positive, this is good future inflation. Overall, there will be a slight increase in inflation over the future horizon, which corresponds to a, a slight increase in the price level, okay? But it's very small, it's almost zero, okay? Um, now, so to summarize, a surprise increase in interest rates uh, leads to an expected loss in return to bondholders. It decreases the market value of the debt. It increases expected returns going forward, making it more costly to issue additional debt. The aggregate primary surpluses increases in the short and the long run. Germany stands as a, an outlier here. Sorry, I, I, I got distracted by the noise. So there is the heterogeneity here on the, on the fiscal. You can see that Germany is the only country which overall reacts with a deficit, okay? So in, in reaction to a contraction. So uh, Germany goes, uh, uh, it can be, uh, can be uh, fiscal policy is, uh, can, can be characterized as a crosswind, while in the other countries, uh, this is as coordination. Oh, and uh, so, so this is the main, uh, you know, one of the main results of the paper is that Germany st seems to behave on a fiscal, uh, at a fiscal level differently than the other country. First increases and then correct the surplus. 
the adjustment in returns, as I said, dominates the fiscal adjustment and offset the deflationary effect on monetary and fiscal policy. <laughs> and at the end, <laughs> in the long run, you have a small uh, positive effect on the price level. Now, I'm running out of time, so I can run to the same exercise on the unconventional monetary policy. So rather than uh, uh, showing you, you all the charts one by one, I will just give you the punchline here. What is interesting here, uh, this is the, the, the table which correspond to the unconventional, is that here actually the fiscal uh, adjust very little uh, for sure in France and Spain, and overall it adjusts uh, not very much, but uh, again on the same direction, okay? When you have an unconventional contraction, you uh, countries react overall with a surplus. Not Germany, which has a large uh, uh, um, uh, you know, change in the opposite direction. So it's maybe perhaps more intuitive to think here of a conventional monetary easing in which all countries react, uh, basically either do not react or react with a, with a, with a little deficit, increase in deficit, primary deficit, while uh, Germany reacts with uh, a fiscal surplus. The returns here move a lot and they move more, not surprising, because here what we are really moving is the long-term interest rate. And therefore, given the maturity structure of that, uh, in uh, uh, European countries, uh, so the federal returns is larger. So overall, the, uh, uh, the overall the cumulative effect of inflation, if you sum the future inflation and the inflation on impact, uh, it is uh, actually negative. So there is a, for a contraction is negative, for an easing is positive. Um, so. Uh, Overall, qualitatively, we have a similar uh, response than conventional easing, but uh, the res fiscal response is overall smaller. But uh, the idiosyncratic behavior of Germany is actually quite large. Um, and uh, uh, as a consequence, the overall adjustment of inflation required in equilibrium is larger and negative. So um, let me just, uh, I mean, I, I basically gave you the, uh, you know, the, the, the main results of this paper, which uh, also has, uh, you know, can other levels of complication. Um, I think what I want to flag is that, uh, you know, whatever happened to inflation uh, is a complicated result of this interaction between the, the fiscal and the behavior of returns, which themselves depends also on many things, on the maturity structure, on revision of inflation expectation, uh, on the term premium, and so on. So you really have to track all this different dimension of adjustment. And uh, one thing that we have identified that is normally countries uh, are coordinated with monetary policy rather than uh, cross, you know, going in the opposite direction, cross winds, except for Germany. So, you know, the implication of that uh, uh, is that uh, um, a potential explanation of the small effect on inflation of unconventional monetary policy easing, not, not, notwithstanding their large effect on spread, is that fiscal policy in Germany has leaned against, uh, you know, the ease of uh, unconventional monetary policy. Uh, obviously, this has to be taken with, uh, uh, with a grain of uh, you know, judgment with some judgment as, and some uh, because, uh, as you have seen, the kind of uh, identification strategy that we have proposed uh, are creative, but uh, you know they are uh, you know torturing torturing the data quite a bit. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, we I think that they 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 yes, you know, all the results are quite reasonable. The impulse response functions are reasonable. And the magnitude also of these changes are quite reasonable. So I think that uh, uh, the message uh, should hold. And, uh, uh, and that's it. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucrezia. And now the floor is yours, Otmar. Can you hear me? Very well, very well. OK, Claudio. Thank you for inviting me to this webinar, which gives also a kind of opportunity to continue the excellent cooperation I had with Lucrezia Reichlin during our common time at the ECB. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate 
Lucrezia and her co-authors on their impressive empirical research. Uh, what I will try to do just to complement her presentation by some very simple observations on the challenges monetary policy currently is confronted with. Please, first slide. The present crisis is very different from previous ones. Economic development depends crucially on the ability to control the pandemic. Almost everywhere, a second wave has hit the economy and uncertainty arising from problems with public health is not an aspect which can be counted among the well-known factors from the history of the business cycle. The promise of a new vaccine also contributes to uncertainty, though from the positive side. On top, the COVID-19 crisis came at a time when a rare combination of fundamental factors presents challenges for economic policies in general. These are related to digitalization, change in the speed and structure of globalization, demographics, and most of all, climate change. Though these factors seem far away from the fear, their sphere, central banks have to take them into account and cannot ignore the demands from policymakers and the general public to act and meet these challenges. Next slide, please. The message for the short term is rather simple. Continue with the present policy as long as needed, but not longer. However, two aspects must not be neglected. Estimating the overall impact of the arsenal of measures presents a daunting challenge. The same is true for organizing the exit once the crisis recedes. While monetary policy will have a short-term influence on asset prices, the banking system and financial markets, central bankers, central banks must not neglect the longer-term developments and risks as they have done after the financial crisis of uh, 2007-8. In their they presented an approach to contain or even avoid financial market volatility, and by that central banks have more or less trapped themselves in a position of financial dominance. The longer this situation continues, the more difficult it will be to escape from this trap without causing major financial market turbulence. The discussion on leaning is still ongoing. To assume that longer term financial stability can always be ensured by micro potential policy, irrespective of the risks caused by large scale asset purchases and a de facto central bank put is expecting too much from an instrument that is still in its infancy and exposed to political interference. Monetary policy must play a proactive role by also taking longer term financial stability aspects into account, recognizing that the financial cycle is substantially longer than the business cycle. Central banks must reconsider also their strategy and the ongoing review should be much, much broader. No model of inflation targeting exists so far which can integrate the risk from the banking system and the financial markets with all their dynamics, non-linearities and overall complexity. The time horizon of inflation targeting is restricted to a period for which a reasonably reliable inflation forecast can be made. From this result, the need to collect all information not entering the inflation forecast into a separate box or pillar or whatever you might call it. These factors with very different time horizons must be collected, analyzed and compressed into a clear message. Before taking moderate policy decisions, the result that 
<clears throat> stems from the inflation forecast must be cross-checked against the result from the, I would call it, box analysis. Although its proponents might still call it inflation targeting, in essence, this will be a very different strategy. What remains is a commitment to a numerical target for inflation. Important enough, but very different from the concept, the previous concept of inflation targeting. Central banks are being asked in, to contribute to the fight against climate change, what is probably the biggest challenge of our time. Climate change, actual and potential, can pose high risks to, in, <clears throat> to entire classes of financial assets. To the extent that central banks act as regulators and supervisors charged with assessing risk for financial markets and the banking sector, they must take the environmental dimension, dimension into account. These factors are having an increasing influence on many variables entering the inflation forecast and the box for cross-checking. As such, monetary policy will implicitly take environmental aspects into account and stabilization policy is given a broader but very complex perspective. Yet the demand for a green monetary policy, whatever it means, does not stand alone. Taking aspects of distribution into account is an even tougher challenge for central banks. If the Fed officially has accepted such a responsibility, other central banks will be under strong political and moral pressure <clears throat> to follow. This conceptual challenge for stabilization policy are obvious, but the main concern is political. Distributional policies must remain the competence of the government of politics which are responsible to their voters. Central banks must also abstain from granting preferential credit to certain groups of society, sectors or individual banks. Combining all current requests to extend the accountability of central banks a corresponding mandate would include price stability, high employment or growth, financial stability, climate change and distribution. Such an extension shows the close relationship between a self-chosen mandate for a variety of tasks and a lack of responsibility and competence for one specific goal. Such an extension of a central bank's mandate is not compatible with the statute of independence. An independent central bank cannot be endowed with responsibility that in a democracy must remain in the rearm of politics. What we can observe on a global scale is an overburdening of central banks through a combination of pressure from the general public and especially the financial sector, political decisions and politically ambitious self-interest. Such overburdening will undermine the case for the status of independence. Extending the mandate legally or uh, by their own decision, uh, extending the mandate of the central bank has also negative consequences for its stabilization policy. The greater the number of goals, the higher the risk of conflicts between them. One must not refer to the Kinberger rule to see this problem. It is an almost impossible, mission impossible, to design a strategy which translates an appropriate reaction of all objectives within an extended mandate into a consistent policy. Under such a regime, it is hard to imagine that over time, priority for price stability would survive. Next slide, please. A few remarks on the interaction of monetary and uh, fiscal policy. Fiscal policy, fiscal policy is the appropriate tool to target actions, to limit or compensate for the damage of the supply shock, as well as sector-specific demand shocks. The effects can also be achieved rapidly once decisions are taken. 
These are all advantages of fiscal policy measures. However, the political process needs time. And as we can see, this time lag appears to be almost endless in the European Union. There's a great danger that many actions might come too late and from a macroeconomic perspective could even have a prosecutory impact arriving and the recovery is already underway. For monetary policy, the opposite applies. Decisions can be taken at any time. The corresponding time lag is largely in irrelevant. Yet, the impact of monetary policy cannot and should not be targeted to specific purposes and the transmission lag is rather long. To cut a very complex story extremely short, the fiscal authority and the central bank should follow a strategy of what I would call implicit coordination with a clear assignment of their respective roles. But a central bank should not engage in a kind of political negotiation process and commit itself in explicit ex ante coordination. The pandemic is no reason to blur the line of responsibility between the central bank and the fiscal authority. The line is already blurred uh, enough by many conventional, unconventional uh, measures by the central bank. The central bank would risk its credibility and undermine its independence. Uh, next slide, please. To conclude, from the perspective of the central bank, the pandemic does not provide a case for specific actions of monetary policy. In essence, its task is to contribute to the stabilization of the demand side of the economy. The lesson from the financial crisis of 2007-8 should be that even in the middle of the crisis, the central bank should look beyond the end of the crisis, which implies not losing sight of the exit from the very expansionary policy. Adopting, uh, I would like just uh, to refer that the same is also true for fiscal policy. Uh, to uh, <clears throat> wait uh, until the crisis is over to design a new concept uh, of a fiscal framework, uh, a new interpretation of the stability and growth pact or something new, uh, should not be delayed because then it's too late uh, when the situation uh, after the exit uh, comes. For central banks adopting the option of yield curve control is a kind of institutionalized fiscal dominance. At the same time, actors in financial markets could rely on the cap for a long-term interest rate which is guaranteed by the central bank. Although this might look like a powerful monetary policy instrument to stabilize markets during the crisis, handling the exit from the policy would be a tremendous challenge for the central bank. <clears throat> the exit from yield curve control would become more difficult the longer it is persecuted. Rising interest rates would be a shock to the fiscal or situation, as public debt would have risen to very high levels in the meantime. The pressure from politics and the financial industry on the central bank not to let interest rates rise would be tremendous. But any delay in doing so when needed should entail an increasing risk of inflation. The financial sector will further increase its leverage and risks due to the expectation of future asset purchases and yield curve control by the central bank. The impact of eventually higher interest rates on the banking sector could bring weak banks to the brink of insolvency. Responsibility for financial stability, with or without a specific mandate, should prevent the central bank from implementing that instrument of yield curve, uh, yield curve control at all, or compel the central bank to make its exit as smoothly and as soon as possible. Besides the pandemic, central banks are confronted with expectations to deal with the challenges stemming, as I mentioned at the beginning, from climate change and to contribute to more just distribution. It is high time that central banks abstained from enjoying the increased attention that comes 
when they declare responsibility for goals of such importance to society. Instead, they should warn against exaggerated expectations and stress the limits of what their policies can achieve. To conclude, central banks are not omnipotent. They play an important role in society. When reality demonstrates that central banks cannot deliver on expectations they are confronted with, or have even fostered themselves, their credibility will be lost. The decline of the reputation of central banks will come at a high cost to society. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Otmar. Uh, I think we had two presentations which are indeed highly complementary. I would say that Lucrezia focused mainly on the short-term interaction between uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy in the euro area. Uh, Otmar broadened the horizon. He talked more about longer-term issues, about framework issues. And in that context, the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy, but from a very, very different uh, perspective. So now we have about 15 minutes for the general Q&A session. But before I do that, uh, let, me, let me ask uh, Lucrezia uh, whether she would like to uh, comment on what uh, Otmar has just said. Ms. Reichling, you have received an unmute request. You should accept it. So okay. to unmute. Hello. Hello. Okay. Hello. Thank you, Claudio. No, I, I, I won't comment uh, on what Artman says. Uh, we had other occasion to, to comment on the general issues. I just wanted to stress uh, something about something you said, okay, so that uh, I looked at the short term, but also the long term, because I looked at the infinite horizon adjustment. But, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's infinite. <laughs> But okay, so but in a way, I mean, I didn't work, I didn't think about a normative issue. I think that Otmar focused on normative, I focus on the past. Okay. What happened? So let me, okay, now the floor is open for questions. And I will do my best to, to find you, uh, also with Boris's expert uh, assistance. Do you see anything? Okay, it, so let me just uh, give you a bit more time to, to reflect. Paolo. Oh, Paolo, are you? Uh, you should raise your hand with um, using the system. Okay, Paolo, fine. Uh, yes, now I see you. Please go ahead. Trying to unmute. Hi, Lucrezia. Hi, Otmar. Um, I, this is just an, an opportunity for Lucrezia to comment on an aspect of the model, perhaps. Um, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, R star in the model, uh, there is no role for a time varying R star in the model. Uh, the calibration uh, takes R star as given uh, uh, to balance. Basically, it's R star is set at uh, 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 equal to the, to the Paolo, I seem we uh, we seem to have the same problem that we had during. Can you hear me? Well, we seem to have the same problem that we had uh, remember during the working party. Uh, your voice keeps uh, breaking up. Maybe if you, yeah, if you switch but, off the camera, it might work better. Yeah, if a video. The question is very simple. What is the role for a time varying R star in your model? And if R star had to be lower than the steady state uh, uh, during the transitional dynamics, uh, would it be this a reason for uh, uh, lowering the path of inflation in response uh, to the monetary impulse, uh, regardless? of fiscal interaction, or at least to mute some of the fiscal interactions that you are you're emphasizing. Just an opportunity to, to comment on this aspect. Thanks. And should I answer or 
Well, okay, thank you, thank you, Paolo, for the question. So, as uh, as you as you saw, I mean, we are putting uh, these dogmatic priors so in which uh, uh, you know it's just one number for the steady state. Okay, so that uh, so of course uh, we know that. Uh, uh, Possibly our stars has changed. Of course, so we are talking about the steady state, so it's not clear what the steady state means. Okay, so it's a very, very, very long term. So that, uh, so if we had uh, to do something different with a kind of time varying, I mean, I don't think this would be kind of reasonable from an empirical point of view. But of course, I mean, the, the, uh, with the our star declining, there is even more case for unconventional. So those interactions through the returns, uh, which are huge for, for in conventional monetary policy, given the fact that the maturity structure of the debt is more than one period on average, uh, you know, would they would would compensate, you know, there would be even more a case of saying, look, I mean, when you are thinking of the monetary fiscal interaction, you also have to think about the fact that the returns on the market value of the debt compensate the, those those effects. And so you you know that uh, and, um, and 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 these are very powerful uh, mechanisms for transmissions. So that uh, which uh, you know interact either positively or negative with the fiscal response. Okay, so both things are important. That's, but you know the case, of course, uh, you know we will be with uh, you know with a higher probability as the zero lower bound. So that the long term effect will be more important. I'm looking here to see whether anyone would like to come in. Also, trying to see whether you're raising your hand physically. Can I you? Yes. Yes, so Benoit speaking. Ah, Benoit, okay. Please go ahead. Yes, so uh, Lucrezia, so you, you, you describe a situation where um, the uh, monetary policy, the fiscal policy of one of the member states is is uh, operating like against the direction that monetary policy is trying to make. And uh, this country you identify to be Germany. Uh, how do you reconcile this with the narrative that in the, in the sovereign debt crisis, there was a bigger effort to reduce primary surplus at the periphery, not so much at the, at the core of the euro area. From this viewpoint, the, the narrative that you, you describe is somewhat counterintuitive with this kind of uh, reading of the crisis putting pressure on the periphery fiscal adjustment rather than on the core. Lucrezia? I mean, maybe following up on... Just, oh, yes? Just adding on that, because just to fully understand clearly you impose the the budget constraint um the solvency constraint uh, and you impose it at the level of the system as a whole correct of the aggregate uh, uh, budget deficit budget position but at the same time so that implies some transfers but at the same time you have different interest rates for the for the various economies which would suggest that the transfers are not quite there um, and, uh, and then, therefore, I was just wondering also how within your model you could capture, indeed, as, um, as Benoit was saying, an episode like the, the sovereign crisis, which was really about individual countries. Um, so if you could sort of uh, somehow elaborate on, on all of that. I think they're related, closely related. Yes, okay. So, first of all, transfers are possible, but uh, I'm not saying that there are transfers or not. Of course, uh, you know, to a certain extent, you know, there is a difference in risk premium. So, you know, there is no total 100% guarantees from the central bank empirically, okay? So, I mean, the model gives you the flexibility of, of, of transfers. It doesn't impose transfers, okay? So, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, it leaves the data to speak. Um, now, we are looking at, uh, uh, at the response conditional on a particular shock. So we are slicing the data. So we are saying what happens when you have a movement uh, 
of the slope, the, the yield slope uh, that goes in one direction uh, and uh, what happens when you have the slope that goes in the other direction, okay? So we are slicing the data in order to identify, okay? Because we want to make some causality statement. So, I mean, if you look at the unconditional data, you see that Italy and uh, Germany are the two countries that over the sample run a primary surpluses on average. And uh, so, but we are not looking at that. We are looking at the adjustment to a particular shock. And uh, of course, uh, I mean, if we were interested to uh, study the, 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 the Greece shock, okay, so the debt crisis shock, or, you know, it would be maybe a different type of shock, okay? So it would be a redenomination risk shock. In fact, we thought about uh, doing something like that, okay? So that would be a shock that, uh, for example, increases the, the cross-sectional spread you know, by a lot, okay? So that, uh, you know, German, the Bund, uh, you know, the Italian uh, uh, interest rate over, over the Bund rate. So that would be that kind of shock. So, but over those, uh, you know, responding to the two shocks that we have proposed to identify in this paper, uh, this is what we find. So we find that when monetary policy is, uh, Italy and France uh, increase the deficit, the primary deficit. When bonded parity contracts, Italy and France go in the same direction, increase the primary surpluses. Germany does uh, does it in the opposite way, but because I think it is inbuilt in the balanced budget rule in Germany, so that uh, in the short run they react like uh, like France and Italy, but in the long run they adjust because they go back to parity. So, I mean, they have a specific dynamic pattern over time, which I think it's interesting and probably, you know, close to, uh, to what, you know, the intuition would tell you. Um, so, I mean, this is, the, the, but the beauty of this framework is that you can act with, tell me what is your preference shock, you want to do a debt crisis shock, we could uh, build it in. Thank you. Thank you, Lucrezia. I'm looking at the. Do you see any? Uh, okay, Lucrezia. Then let me ask you uh, one more question, which is again very much related to the relationship between uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy. Now, in your budget constraint, how or if in any way do you yeah. include the the transfers? Uh, from central banks to the government, um, somehow not explicitly, but they are included in there. Um, in fact, if you recall at the at the previous webinar, there was uh, quite a, bi a bit of an interaction between uh, Ricardo and others talking about the impact of large scale asset purchases. Uh, on the consolidated balance sheet of the central bank uh, and the government, here the government and the central banks, um, in the sense that when you buy long-term paper and you buy a lot of it, from the consolidated perspective of the balance sheet of the central bank, uh, of the government plus the central bank, what you're doing is a very large open market operation whereby you are retiring long-term debt and issuing short-term debt. And uh, what I was wondering is somehow how that is captured in your, in your model, I guess indirectly. More importantly, what is that you think about that type of operation in terms of the longer term relationship between the central bank and the government? And this is a question, of course, that uh, I could also uh, direct to Otmar. <laughs> Well, I mean, my, for me, I mean, uh, uh, you know, we, we take the, per, the perspective uh, of, uh, of a, the general government in which uh, is the consolidated government of the central bank uh, and, and, and treasuries, treasuries, okay? So, um, you know, certain operations uh, are neutral, okay? So that, uh, but, you know, if you want me to comment on, this, on the other discussion, what happens, uh, uh, you know, when... Uh, when uh, when there are asset purchases, I mean, what happened, you know, outside my model. So for me, the uh, you know the mechanism. Since I'm interested in inflation, it is, it is outside. I'm actually asking you to go beyond yeah, okay. the model and to comment. Uh, on okay, that. Yeah, so yeah. I will go. Okay. yeah, of course, of course. I mean that uh, what happens uh, when you when uh, the central bank buys uh, long dated government securities. Uh, 
um, what happens uh, is that uh, uh, you know it retires uh, uh, you know it retires maturity from the market and uh, absorb some of the risk in the in the in the in the balance sheet of the central banks so it's a redistribution of risk and this has implication for the credit risk and all the issues that that Omar is worrying about and uh, you know in the, in recent ecb discussions uh, related to their strategy and the citra i made the point that you have to uh, when you are worrying about risk uh, related to financial or fiscal policy you know monetary policy which uh, kind of spill over in, in the financial and fiscal territory you have to worry about the total amount of risk so how much risk you induce by for example low interest rate and how much you are redistributing in the budget of the central bank both have both matters okay and uh, and both risks have to be managed okay so that uh, and the question is how you want to manage them um, now in this particular paper we are not addressing that problem but we are saying whatever you do even if you do the most innocent uh, uh, conventional monetary policies you have these fiscal interactions and uh, and of course you know these changes uh, in uh, so and, and uh, you know you have these fiscal interactions and, and so even if you uh, from the normative perspective you do not want to get into fiscal policy those fiscal interactions are there and they can either work against you or in, in your favor thank you so much i don't know whether otmar you would like to add anything agree I think the problem is is the material risk premium now positive or negative and how it is will it be a risk tributed as uh, Lucrezia hinted on uh, from the uh, from the central bank from the public sector and financial markets I, I think this distribution new distribution of risks uh, is very very difficult to entangle Okay, thank you, Otmar. So I think we have uh, come to the end of the session. Uh, I would like to thank the uh, panelists for uh, presenter and discussant for the really broad ranging uh, uh, discussion that we've had. Um, now, let me just uh, give you a preview of the next two uh, webinars that we are going to have. The next one is on the 10th of December and is going to be uh, by Marcus Brunemeyer. And it's going to be rather different. He's going to be looking at the future of the monetary system. And the discussant is Bruno Biez. And then on the 16th of December, uh, the final uh, webinar of the series is going to be by Matteo Maggiori on global financial flows and exchange rates. And the discussants, the two in this case, are Linda Tessar and Laura Alfaro. So with that, I would like to thank everyone, in particular the, uh, the speaker and the, and the discussant, and everyone else who's participated and listened to these presentations. Uh, and we'll see you, hopefully see you. I don't really see many of you, but uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>